Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may you know the great compassion of our Lord, the love that he has for each of you. May you not only receive this great love, but may it fill your hearts and lives in all relationships that you have. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with, for the sure love that we have to share with one another, for we only know love because we know you. Lord, may our lives each and every day be filled with your love, that we may graciously share that with all those in our lives. Lord, we ask for that you would forgive us for those times when our lives be, become, uh, become caught up in ourselves. Help us always be give, give as you first gave to us. This we pray in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Canadian journalist and novelist, uh, also historian, Thomas Costein wrote a book called The Three Edwards. In that book, The Three Edwards, he wrote of a man by the name of, actually a duke by the name of Reynold III. Now, Reynold III, he was a Belgium duke of the 14th century, true story, and he was referred to by his Latin name, also very derogatory name, Crassus. Now, I'm sure that most of you do not know Latin, so that name actually means fat. Reynold III was known for being grossly overweight. In fact, one day he got into a bit of a dispute with his brother Edward, and, and his brother Edward then led a revolt against him, and he imprisoned him, but maybe not in the way you might normally imagine. He built a room around him in, New in Newkirk Castle, and in the castle, in that room, there were plenty of open windows, absolutely no bars on the windows. There was a door. It was just a little smaller than a normal-sized door, no lock on that door. What Edward told his brother, Reynold III, is if you lose weight, then you can regain your position and you can regain your title. Well, ten years passed. And th in 1371, Edward died in battle. Finally, Reynold III was released. The whole time, his brother had offered to him delicacies after delicacies, and he could not say no, no matter how many things were offered to him. Sadly, his reign only lasted for another year after that, and he died in 1372 because he was grossly overweight to the point that it killed him. Now, you might imagine at first that this would be appropriate for the Sunday when we talked about gluttony, but I think this illustration also captures the sin of lust quite well, as lust also is, seems to be an insatiable desire, an insatiable appetite. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've talked about greed and we've talked about gluttony and the way that those sins divide us from God because they get to our very hearts. Well, lust is no different, but lust, unlike an attitude, seems to come much more quickly. It goes through our eyes, through our ears, and straight to our hearts. In fact, listen to the words of Jesus again from our gospel reading for this morning. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just that look. Just seeing and thinking that heart can be changed. Now Jesus gives the example of a man, but ladies, he's also referring to women in this message as well. And we might think that this is something that only comes later in life. But I remember vividly when I was in the third grade, I had a friend in, I won't share his name, I had a friend in Sunday school. He didn't go to the Lutheran school I went to, but I, we made friends because we regularly went to Sunday school together. And his dad and mom were divorced, and one day after church, my parents invited uh, his dad and my friend to come over. They, we all had lunch, and then they, the parents uh, had coffee and were talking, and we went off and we were playing, my brother, myself, and my friend. Well, my friend, he bragged about the fact that in the trunk of his dad's car, right parked out front, was a Playboy magazine, and he had seen it. Now, I was only in third grade, but I knew what a Playboy magazine was already. It happens early. When I was young, it seems like you had to open a trunk that it was hard to find. But in this day and age, it's all over the place. Women and men in various stages of undress. You can turn on your computer, turn on your television, and it won't take you long. I would challenge you, but I challenge you not to do this. But if you, any, any show that's on TV, you're going to find at least one element 
of a woman or man in various stages of undress. Now, when I was younger, I didn't remember it being that bad, but certainly it is true of today. And it doesn't have to be electronic media. You can buy magazines. You can go to a store. You can walk around town. You can drive by the park. And you can see. Well, you can see people who are gawking and people who are looking and people who are lusting. And it's not just a matter of the eyes, is it? So often we, we, we kind of tie lust right to the eyes. But, well, let's be honest with ourselves. Lust is also comes in other forms. Some of you ladies, I'm sure, have read what the so-called romance novels before. Usually in those so-called romance novels, there's the escapades and graphic explanations of what is going on, of these adulterous relationships. How about soap operas? It's not just for the eye candy, as they call it, but the storyline as well, a lustful storyline. Some of you are also familiar with a series of books that came out, starting with the book Fifty Shades of Grey. It was made into a movie. Now, I don't know how many of you or if any of you have seen it, but this movie depicts an adulterous relationship that is not at all what God intended for the relationship for man and wife and husband and wife in marriage. And in the book, through this series, depicts a very, very anti Christian viewpoint. This movie brought in 81 million in the first weekend. The book has sold over 100 million copies. And unfortunately, many Christian people have not only read these books, but they've seen the movie, they've bought the movie. I know lust and sexuality can be an uncomfortable topic to talk about. I've even heard people say that it should not be talked about in the church because what happens in the bedroom should remain in the bedroom. But I don't agree with this, and nor does Jesus. Notice who Jesus was speaking to. He was speaking to a crowd of people. He understood that some things have not changed, that some things in our world, unfortunately, still are very much alive. Now our world says, well, just let it be. A little glance here and a little glance there. There's nothing wrong with that. Families will say, well, pornography is better than, well, actually the physical relationship. Jesus says the opposite. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members and then your whole body goes into hell. Pretty intense, don't you think? Sounds like Jesus took this pretty seriously. Now, I don't think that he actually literally wants us to be plucking out our eyes, cutting off our hands, but what he does intend is for us to cut these sins out of our lives, to cut these sins out of our eyesight, out of our hands, to be aware of the impact these sins have on us. Sometimes I think we undermine how great the, the impact is. But the images from these books, from these movies, from this content, it gets burned into our minds and burned into our hearts, into our imaginations. It's something that stays and doesn't go away. When Jesus talks about lust, he talks about it as a burning desire. He uses this Greek word epithemeo. And epithumeo, is, is the word itself is neither holy or, or sinful or wicked. It does refer to a strong desire. For instance, in Luke 22, it refers to Jesus' great desire, a burning desire in his breast to eat the Last Supper with his disciples. But when he uses it to refer to lust, he's referring to a sinful desire. Sexuality was created for husband and wife to be shared alone by husbands and wives. It was meant to be a joy. But like all things, God has created beautiful and joyful. The devil sought to destroy it, sought to undermine it, sought to mar it and make it ugly. And this is where lust comes into play. It's a strong desire not for your spouse, but a strong desire for someone who other than your spouse. And this is not just a sin of married couples. This is a sin that inflicts all of our society. This is a sin that afflicts single people, a young, old, married, or unmarried. And sadly, many of you have seen the way that this sin can hurt a marriage, 
can hurt relationships. Many of you, if not personally, you know of people whose relationships have been destroyed by lust, by seeking after other spouses, other women, or other men. And unfortunately, lust, it becomes an insatiable desire. It becomes a desire that needs to be fed more and more. Paul Harvey tells us, tells a story of the way an Eskimo would kill a wolf. Maybe some of you, if you listen to Paul Harvey, have heard this before. But he starts out and he dips his blade of his knife in blood. Then he lets the blood of the animal freeze on it. Then he dips it in blood again and lets the animal blood freeze on it until you cannot see the blade anymore. Then as night falls, he puts the blade upright in the snow. A wolf, as you know, has keen sense of smell. He smells that blood. And he finds the knife. And at first, he'll slowly and deliberately lick the knife, testing it. But as he tastes the blood on the knife, his voracious appetite grows and he begins to lick it more and more rapidly until before he knows it. He doesn't feel the pain of the knife piercing his own tongue and he is lapping his own blood. And by morning, the wolf is dead. So too is lust. It starts out with a glance here and a glance there with a little peek at pornography, with a little glance at another woman, another man, a little bit more and a little bit more. The insatiable desire grows. It grows and it grows and it grows until there is spiritual death. Spiritual death. Lust is no insignificant sin. It is truly a sin that afflicts all of us because it serves our own self, hedonistic self-desire our own pleasures. God says we're not to lust after one another, but to love one another. Lust and love often used together are actually opposites. Because lust looks at me, what I want, what I desire. Love, on the other hand, looks at the other person. How many times in Scripture does God's Word tell us that you are to love one another? The second greatest commandment. The first is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. It is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Make sure you memorize that, guys. I want you to say it with me next time. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that means to care for one another. Lust doesn't care for anybody but self. Love cares for the other person. It cares and it, and it hurts when the other person hurts. It celebrates when the other person celebrates. This is not merely meant for the marriage relationship, although I think it's most beautifully seen there, but it is meant in all of our relationships. We are to love one another. And in fact, love is the root not of passion. Passion happens between husbands and wives, but it is the root of compassion. Now, I love this word, and if you've been to any of my Bible studies, you know the word that's coming. It's the word splugnizomai. And this word, besides the fact it's fun to say, this word is the word translated compassion. But the reason I like it is because it talks about how we are to love one another. It's meant to come right from our belly. A love that is so deep that it involves our whole selves. It's not just that we talk about love in the heart, but, but the Bible, it talks about love that comes from the very being of a person. And that's the love we are to have for one another. Whether married or single, that is the love we are to have. Whether a child or an adult, the love we are to have. Not putting ourselves first, but putting others before ourselves. And that flies in the face of the world, doesn't it? Because the face of the world, the faith, the, the, the world says that we should fill our own pleasures. We should fill our own desires. Our measurement for what is right and what is wrong becomes, well, what makes me happy, what brings me the most pleasure. But that's not what God's Word says. God's Word says that it is truth, that we find truth through Him. And that truth comes in knowing that love that he first had for us. I love how John says it in his epistle, to his first epistle. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So beautiful because we see where love begins. 
You cannot know love unless you know God because in God is love. And in God, He has shown us the greatest act of love because He sent His Son, Jesus, while we were yet sinners, lusting after our own desires, our own pleasures. He sent His Son, Jesus, to pour out every last drop of His blood, to shed His blood for you, for me, for every one of us on the cross. And on the cross, He paid the price for us. On the cross, He showed us the greatest gift of love we could ever know. On the cross, Jesus said, I love you and I forgive you. And that is what true love is. It is that self-sacrifice. It is giving of self for another. And that is what Jesus did for us. Now I know in this world that we live in, so often our love is broken. So often our desires do overwhelm us and they, they run free in us. But Jesus said there is an answer. Give of ourselves. Love as he first loved us. Instead of asking what brings me pleasure, ask how I might care for someone else. Husbands and wives, how might I support my spouse? How might I care for my spouse? How might I trust him or her? Most importantly, is there an opportunity for forgiveness? Parents with ki children, how am I leading my children? How am I raising them? Grandparents, this is true for you too. What example am I setting for them? Am I showing them love? Or am I showing them my own self-interest? We can show this love in our church as we care for one another, supporting one another. When one of the members is hurting, as Paul says, then all the body should hurt. When one of the members celebrates, then all the body should celebrate. We show love by supporting one another. We show love to our community, to our world, by not letting them die without hearing the good news, by hearing that gospel message that Jesus died for them. Our love in this life, it's true, it's broken, it's imperfect. Sometimes it's self-serving instead, instead of reflecting the love of Christ serving others. But Jesus says, as often as we sin, we return to the waters of our baptism. We return again to those waters where we heard those, the forgiveness the first time. The Lord says, if you confess your sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And as often as we confess our sins, Jesus again repeats those words to us. I love you and I forgive you. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and minds. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for the great love that you have shown us, pouring it out for us in your blood. Lord, we pray that each and every day that we would live lives that reflect your love to others, sharing it with others. Forgive us for those times when we are overcome by our sinful lusts, our sinful passions, those times when we give in to our own desire. Forgive us for those times. Instead, lead our hearts to have a great desire for you, knowing that only in you is where we will find true love. Only in you is where we find mercy. And only in you is where we find the promise that one day we shall be with you forever. In all things, we thank and praise you, serve and obey you. In the name of Jesus, we pray together. Amen.